Hello, I'm Seamless, and today is Monday, which is really only something I say in Reflex because honestly, that has no bearing on what I'm doing today. And this is going to be a continuation in the series of production basics. And the last time we talked about equalization in terms of mixing and using it like, and like that, what, what it can be useful for. Today, we're going to be talking about compression, which is kind of like the other half of that in terms of the overall idea of mixing and mastering. Still not talking about mixing and mastering, but we are talking about specifically what compression does. Compression is actually pretty straightforward. All that, are, all that it's designed to do is that it compresses the dynamic range of a sound. So what is the dynamic range? Well, uh, I have a file here. This is the Vox from the demo project in FL Studio, Aren't You Clever? And we can see that there were some differences between, say, this section. The way you space things apart. And this section. It always makes my day. This is not really a problem most of the time, but just, I'm just using this as a sort of a, a reference for what I mean by things like dynamic range. So this is the part that is rather, rather loud. And this is the part that's rather quiet. And dynamic range is kind of pretty much the difference between these parts. Or the idea pretty much is the idea of... Well, I was about to going to say something about dynamic range, but I realized I wasn't 100% sure about that. It doesn't particularly matter, just because a dynamic range is mostly about how long, like how much the track spends going either from really, really low to really, really high. Versus a track that doesn't have a lot of dynamic range, they might have heard the term sausage thrown around. And sausaging is when you have, a, instead of having a waveform like this, which is very varied and very dynamic, you have a waveform that is blocky and solid and just spends all of its time at maximum volume. That's a track that is a sausage. It has very low dynamic range. It is, in fact, very compressed. Compression has its point, has its purpose. Much like equalization, it could be used as a kind of a utility or it could be used as an effect in terms of things in, in, in the sound design space or for particularly cool mixing aspects. I'm mostly just going to define it for you and show you what it does so that you can make your decision uh, based, on your, based on your own ideas of what you think you should be doing with it. Uh, so let's take this section. It has a lot of a lot of moving around going on, and I have a I have a limiter on the section on the channel that it runs. Now, a limiter is a is a specific kind of compressor. Um, essentially, what it does is that it limits um, the audio from going above a certain point, and by default, the ceiling is set at zero dB. So, actually, let's do a very quick a quick idea of um, of just a very obvious example of compression. I put this I put this in the uh, the um, channel the chain after this guy just so that we can see the results. Everything's so straight. Right now the results are identical. But if I were to bring the ceiling down to say here, then we see that this cut it's basically cutting into these peaks. And then when I play it again, everything's so strange. We see that that happens. Now what I what I need to do now, if I do something like this, is I need to apply makeup gain. So now I'm gonna just bring it up again. Everything's so strange. Everything's so strange. And so here we have a sausage. If we look at uh, just the original input audio here, and get rid of all the lines and stuff. So here's the original input audio, and then in here is the output audio. This is the effect compression has on source, on source audio. So I can see, uh, like right here, for example, this is a very dynamic looking transient of a, of a sound. It's doing, moving around, doing a lot of things. This same position here has almost none of that. It has it goes down to the part where it goes to almost silence, but then it very quickly returns itself back up to being, you know, up here. The movement is much less. The dynamic range is compressed. We have compressed it. Now, how it accomplished this is pretty straightforward. Like this is this is the result, is kind of what happens, but the it accomplished it by doing what you see this white line doing here. This white line is the uh, essentially the volume automation. And you can think of a compressor as something that's automating volume to bring it down to this, this green level here. Let's see if we get rid of, we see this here. Uh, we actually need this line here. We need this line and this line. So this purple background area is the audio that comes in originally. This is what the original audio looked like, much like it does in here. As it goes above this green line, the white line comes in to turn it down dynamically so that it will be below the, the green line. And 
that's pretty much all that's doing. It's just turning turning it turning it down as it uh passes over the, the, the threshold essentially and gets compressed as a result. And then we get this once I turn it up. Because I remember initially initially it was much lower than that because it actually kept it below that line. So that's uh that's how that rolls. I could actually have con con yeah, I could have created this result inside the limiter without going to a second limiter. What I could have done is I could have, uh, instead of bringing the ceiling down, I could have kept the ceiling here, but instead turned the gain all the way up. Everything's so strange. And then we would have a similar result. It's just that the input gain is brought up hugely, and then the ceiling is, is kept at the uh, at the at zero dB, and now the vo the voice is being only turned down when it goes above zero dB, which it did because I brought up the the gain plus eighteen dB, and as you can see, the output looks exactly the way that we expect it to. So that's cool beans. Now, this is this is describing a limiter, and this is also a very quick and dirty looking way of, of how compression works, but let's look at what um, controls that you would normally expect to see in a compressor. On the compressor and compression on the compression side, we had different things. We have uh, this these 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 uh, knobs here that we would expect to see in a regular compressor. We have threshold and ratio. These are, these are the most important two. So a threshold is a lot like the ceiling. And what it does is it determines where uh, it, like from like the point at which it'll start to bring stuff down or up, depending on your settings. Um, and whatever goes above it will do what it needs to do. And the ratio determines how hard it gets compressed. A limiter is, is a kind of compressor that has a ratio set at the ceiling that's just really, really hard. So that it, it ensures absolutely nothing will ever go above it. The ratio of this in this uh, in the compression side only goes up to twenty to one. Now, what the ratio implies, like if I were to set it to two to one, for or yeah, two point zero to one, what that means is that uh, the audio would have to be twice as loud for it to originally for it to come out at its original level. It essentially, means it's going to get, uh, get cut down pretty good. And so, twenty to one means that it would have to be twenty times as loud for it to come out again at its original level. Likewise, you can actually go in the other direction, and we could do one, two, and that means essentially that um, it it was it going to come out twice as loud because it can also do this. Is what's referred to as expansion. It's kind of like the opposite of compression, um, but usually we use compression to actually compress things. Everything's so strange. Now compressing, compressing. I'm still have this hugely. Everything's so strange. Compression like this is a bit more is a bit more dynamic than uh, a limiter doing its job. This is a bit more kind of softish, and you have more control over what it's doing. Everything's so strange. And here we get a bunch of, in, the, in this particular limiter. We get a bunch of uh, interesting visual information. So, if I were to get rid of the audio input, we'll actually see this sort of this blue line going on behind the other blue line. This, the first blue line being the threshold, and this blue line being it's the it's the transient uh peak of the actual incoming audio and then the white line is what it was when we were talking about with the limiter where it's the volume automation to accomplish our compression settings uh but then we have a bunch of other options we had these options as well with the limiter but we have them here too we have attack release and a head so these do interesting things um some of them do what you would expect like uh release is just how long like the reaction time of a compressor to kind of to kind of demonstrate these, I'm actually going to use something else. I'm going to use this. Yeah, yeah. Something really short. Awesome. So let's put you in in, in channel one. So now we have something that has a very, very sharp transient. So we'll see very clearly what the uh, time, what the time options do to things. Let's bring back the visuals. So I'm going to turn it up really huge. Okay. So here we see kind of what it, what it's doing here a little, a little bit. I'm actually going to go into the limit side. I'm going to turn the limiter off essentially by disengaging all the time variables, turning the ceiling all the way up, so that it won't really, it won't, won't, won't really affect it. So here's what here's what it's doing. 
have no attack, so it's apply, it's applying the compression pretty much instantaneously. And then uh, the, here you can see the release time because you see the audio stopped pretty much a long time before the release time actually gave up. If I increase the release time, so does this. Uh, so does the volume automation. So if there was if there were still things happening here, it would actually continue to affect it, even if even though the original transient that caused the triggering of the compression ceased a long time ago. Alternatively, we can bring it way far down and make it really really sharp and turn it all the way off. And it's kind of hard to see, but it's actually reacting very, it's reacting almost 100% to the waveform itself. And this kind of setting, actually if I turn the head all the way off too, now we can see it's just solid white. Because this kind of setting is essentially distortion. It's uh, automating the volume down on, on the oscillation level. It's reacting so fast that it's actually shaping the waveform itself, otherwise known as distortion. Now what does the head setting do? Notice I have the attack and release all the way off. I'm going to turn the head way up. Actually, doesn't do much. Okay, I turned it up too high. We can kind of see it's sort of it's it's acting weird because it is sort of a weird setting. But what what this setting is commonly referred to as is what's, what's called windowing, and what it's doing is it's it's, it's essentially the sustain. Like in the if we're going to call things, you know, the, the attack and the release, and then decay and sustain. This is the this is the sustain. Is this holds. Um, the position for a certain amount of time before it engages the release side of things. So here we can see here's the attack, which the head also kind of screws a little bit. And there's a little bit of time here where it holds before the release begins. That's what the head does. Now, um, you might have noticed that there were these, these time variables also existed on the limit side of the limiter. This is actually something that's very specific to limiter. Um, and also Max, let's talk about that in a second. Um, if I bring the ceiling back down. Let's bring the time variables back. So here's your regular looking thing. Now, if I turn the attack way up, this weirdness happens. So, <laughs> the attack, uh, oh, I forgot it's still going. The attack on the compressor side will do what you would think it does, where the sound hits and then the compression activates a little bit after when the sound hits. It takes, it takes us a second for it to engage. That's what that does. The attack on the limit side uh, actually does what you would think a head does. Because when we see a head on a compressor, we think that's look ahead. And what look ahead means is that it actually processes ahead of um, where the audio is. And there's a number of ways to do this, but the way that the limiter does it is that it actually delays the audio. So right now I have this set to 67 milliseconds. So right here is actually when the audio hit, but we didn't hear the audio until 67 milliseconds passed. And what ha what happens here is that the uh, the um, the compression engages a little bit and leads up until it hits the part there, which I mean it doesn't really it's not really doing that right now because the attack of the head settings are as such. Also because the original sound is very sharp, so it's just applying itself very slowly. The controlling this can be a bit odd, and usually when I'm using the limiter at all, I turn the attack all the way off because I don't want to introduce uh, undue latency to something. But uh, that was mostly just a technical understanding of what the limiter does, but I, do, I wanted to explain those to you because those parameters are going to show up when I talk about how to use Maximus. So Maximus is what's referred to as a multiband compressor. A multiband compressor is pretty much the same thing as a regular compressor, only instead of... Uh, are compressing the entirety of all the sound all at once, it compresses a section of the frequency spectrum. Let's bring back our vocal. Everything's so strange, but never mind. I never care. It always makes my everything. This is actually not a wonderful vocal to test for this because it doesn't have a lot of low frequencies in it. Uh, let's find something a little bit more full. Actually, instead of using a vocal, let's use a drum loop. You know, in part being where it's already kind of compressed, but that's okay. We, we already figured out what compression does, but we want to see what uh, multiband compression can do for us. <sighs> Although, I guess... 
was pretty uncompressed. It's actually considered compressed by most standards, but it's not as compressed as the other one. So anyway, here we're looking at we're looking at a multi spec multi band view of the sound itself. We have a low band, a mid band, and a high band. Now, if um, we were talking about the uh, the, uh, the the really sharp transient, the the little little rim shot sound uh, as you're applying it to to uh, the limiter, and I said with the long release time that if there was anything happening after that, it would also be compressed due to the release time, even though the transient of the audio had already gone, like the audio that triggered the compression was already gone. That's a sort of a very, it's a very sort of, that's a very vertical way of thinking of things. If we think about it horizontally, we could say that if something like a, like a kick drum, for example, happens and it's very loud and it peaks up pretty hugely and it makes the compression hit, it's going to bring down everything. It's going to bring down the entire spectrum, including whatever's happening in the mids and like the hats and stuff like that. And so it's going to affect the overall sound and not be very transparent. What transparent means is that we have an effect that we apply to something that accomplishes what we want, which is usually to compress the dynamic range of something to make it sound louder, and usually, and uh, does so without sounding as if you did. That's what transparency means. And in this case, that will not be very transparent. But because we have more, more than, we essentially have individual compressors that are taking care of only those specific parts of the spectrum, we can say that, okay, cool, yeah, if there's a big-ass peak in the bass, only the bass gets compressed, and the mids and the highs are ignored. They're left alone. They don't need to be dealt with. And that makes, a very, it makes for a very uh, transparent mix. So with a multiband compressor, we're able to create, if we want to, we can create a very transparent mix, or we can create a very incredibly sausage mix where we're using it to crush everything as hard as we can individually or per spectrum, which makes which is a lot easier than trying to crush everything at once because you, you can only push things so far before it starts to sound bad. How far that is is really up to you, but, you know, that's what that means. Uh, Maximus, however, is a, bit, is a bit different from regular compressors. Um... Most compressors have what we what we looked at in the limiter with the idea of the threshold and the ratio and the knee knobs. And the knee really just changes the curve of the ratio and all these things. And those represent, you know, certain certain shapes in the waveform. Like most compressors will give you a little graph kind of like this, where it'll show you how to um like what your settings are going are doing to the sound. However, Maximus doesn't have any of that. It has the time variables. In fact, um, on the low, mid, and the high band, the attack knob does what the attack knob does on the compressor side of the limiter, which is to say that it actually will attack into the, the compressor's curve, the volume automation of the compressor, and not delay the audio. The master will delay the audio. And then we have this LMH delay, which is that audio delay look-ahead processing, but for every all the three bands all at once. Because if you delayed them differently, the different bands differently, then you have your mids not in not in phase with your highs and lows, and that'd be kind of bad. So that's why that's like that. There's a bunch of other stuff, but we're talking about you know most of the basic idea of compression. So we are given this graph, and by default, what we're looking at as a graph is a zero dB limiter. It's saying that nothing goes above zero dB. Most compressors give you this particular kind of graph, and as you might have noticed, I accomplish this graph by manipulating it directly, and that's what Maximus does: is it lets you manipulate the graph directly. Like if so, if I were to set a threshold of minus six dB, and then a ratio of, let's say two to one. That's that's here-ish. Let's say two to one from 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 here minus six, and then doing math. Yeah, whatever, right there. So then this would be the graph that we get. And like if you want to do specific numbers, and you got to figure it out yourself. But the beauty of Maximus, like the limiters, is very visual. We can see where the peaks land. We can see that the peak didn't get anywhere near minus minus six dB, and so I can just pump up the free gain a bit. And we're able to create very dynamic and very specific and very awesome curves for stuff. And we could do even crazier things if we. You really felt like it. So Maximus lets you do very creative stuff, and you're not really limited to the idea of just the standard curves and types and things like that. Now, 
remember earlier when we mentioned the idea of the release time being kind of important and, and the idea of wave shaping. If I speed it up a bit. We can see that the curve is very, very slight here, but if I bring like all the time variables down really far, we can see that it, the, it's actually way sharper now. It's actually, it's actually adhering and reacting very tightly to the thing. And we're not even at the lowest levels. And because this is base, this is actually very uh, direct. And it's that if we if we essentially make the reaction faster than the oscillation of the waveform that goes in, then it'll shape the waveform and cause distortion. So you want to be aware of that. Otherwise, though, a lower release time, a slow, like a faster release time and faster compression in general results in louder, louder compression results, louder results with less uh, compression artifacts. Things like the muddiness that you get from when you overcompress something or the not transparentness of the of the mix in general or just distortion from when you when you, when it's too fast and it's not really a smart kind of fast. And then on top of the three bands, we have the master band, which is a single band compressor. And this exists to kind of like glue everything together after you're done doing all your stuff. So here's an example of faster compression make, makes for louder mixes. So here we can see the peaks that happen. And we can see the compression that we're using to bring it back down. Let's turn it up a little bit. Turn it down the post game because it's kind of loud. So that um, kind of pumpy, smooth, it's not really that bad, honestly, I, I kind of like that sound, but that, that that sort of sound, the very compressy kind of sound is a result of having a very, very slow release times. Notice I made, slow, I made some slow release times in the, in the mids and highs as well. So we'll consider that for a second. Now, much like the example transient we created with the limiter, we could see that the big the big transient happens here, and then it kind of stops. But even though it stopped, we have this big release thing happening here, which is affecting the quieter audio. Even though the original sound that caused the problem that the compressor read as need to be crushed has long passed. So if we were to bring it back, it gets a little more it gets a little more specific, less discriminate in in what it it's it's uh, compressing, which means that thing the 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 level at which it is loud is a little bit more consistent. And louder. How far you can push this is again that's something that, that's up to you in general. Like how hard do you want to uh, crush some things? Like we said with the low frequencies, is still true for the mids and the highs, but the frequencies in the, in the mids and the highs are higher, thus faster, which means that we can go lower, and it won't affect it as hard as the bass did. But as you saw, as I did push it harder, it actually just started to sound like we're distorting it because we are. And in fact, if you do take away all the time variables, this graph essentially becomes a wave shaper, not unlike the actual wave shaper inside FL Studio. So here's an example of what I was talking about, about the master attack and limiting attack as well. See so here we can see, we can see the original transient. This is the, this is the audio as it went into Maximus and then it was delayed and it came out here, but it led into the compression being active here. And as a result, even like it was, it, it's being, it's being brought down, but it's being brought down according to a peak that's massively higher and the sounds that are actually happening right before the peak. So so we're we're hearing this section of audio here, right? This is what this is over here and it's compressing it for this section here. So I bring that's why it's coming all the way down and it's, and it's sounding like the lead in is actually cutting it off right before the hit happens. That's what's the result of that. And that's it. that's that's the result of look ahead 
attack processing for compressors. And such. Now, in terms of using this as a mastering thing, it, it's somewhat obvious in terms of its application. Uh, having the multiband compression on the master means that we can make we can mix the low end together by itself. We can mix the mids and the highs by itself. And then the the point of doing that is that you're able to create a much clearer and much louder picture in, in a way that's transparent before you send it into mastering master limiting which is a single band process which will you know take deal with the peaks as they come but the peaks themselves aren't going to be as erratic and they're not going to be as frequency frequency specific as they were before they came in the master compression that's the idea of multi band compression and i hope all of that made sense so this wasn't this wasn't meant to be a technical look at specifically Maximus and uh, the limiter, but because I was using them, I did explain what they were for a little bit. And also, I'm, I, this isn't sort of like a best practices idea of compression. This is a very basic, what does compression even do? What is it for? That kind of thing. And then what you decide to do with it uh, is going to be determined by what you think is you know the best results for things. Um, if you go by the seamless school thought in terms of what compression is for, then you're just going to make everything as loud as possible for as long as you live. Anyway, if you have any questions about any of that, let me know. And feel free to point out crap that I said wrong. If I did, it, it did say anything wrong. I don't believe that I did, especially because I, you know, use examples. But if I did, tell me. And have a nice day.